Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. When we think of Bonfire Night on 5th of November, we tend to just think of Guy Fawkes. However, my guest today explains how Guy Fawkes was just one of a group of conspirators led by Robert Catesby, the mastermind behind the plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605. My guest is historian Bill Cunningham, and in this episode we talk about the circumstances that inspired and led up to the plot, the characters behind it, and how it was eventually foiled. Please be aware that there are some graphic descriptions of torture in this episode, which some listeners may find disturbing. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I am delighted to be joined again by Bill Cunningham. Bill is an historian and tour guide, and as well as his interest in all things history, he is a member of the Stamford Mayor's Guides. Bill is going to give us an insight into the history of the gunpowder plot and tell us some fascinating stories in the process. Hello and welcome to the show, Bill. Uh, Good afternoon, Bob. Or should I say welcome back to the show? Thank you very much. (laughs) Well, it's it's great to have you on again. Thanks so much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Thank you for Um, inviting me. So how have things been on the history front? Um, yes, fairly steady. Yes, I uh, read and research and carry on. I'm still researching about Stanford and its background. And I've got a little theme at the moment. I'm looking into uh, English aristocratic families. And uh, I've still got my little bit uh, I enjoy about, about the Georgians and the Regency time. So, well, yes, I, I constantly read history. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, my little thing in life now. Well, that, that's great. I mean, one or two of the people that are listening will have heard you before, Bill. And this is the third time you've been on, actually. Um, yeah. But before we talk about your interest in history, what, what's your background? Well, my background is essentially I spent um, years working in finance and industry. And uh, that ended uh, beginning of this year when I decided to, to pack it all in. And um, I've really taken up my hobby, which has been history. So uh, I'm doing the Stanford Mayor's Guides, where we do guided tours of Stanford. Currently, we've uh, we've been doing the standard tour. Recently, we've been doing um, Halloween tours as well about spooks and ghosts. Um, uh, then also, I spent a bit of time, uh, well, really last year, being a guide up at Grimsthorpe Castle, which is a local um, stately home. Uh, unfortunately, this year, due to the COVID um, situation, uh, our launch of the guides was somewhat uh, delayed from March through to July. And uh, Grimsthorpe Castle, unfortunately, has not opened up at all. So it's been a little bit affected by by, by the COVID situation. But hopefully that'll be over and things can, can carry forward. Yeah, well, I, I, I think we all hope it hope it will be very soon. And on the other, other, the other subject of history, what, what made you become so interested in history? Don't know. I just always have. Always been with me since I was a small child. Um, I read history books um, when I was seven or eight, uh, going back to all sorts of things. Um, I read War and Peace when I was about 11 or 12. 11 uh, or 12? Yeah, I, I just I just love the whole thing. I can imagine the people in my mind. Uh, you can give me dates and I'll remember them. It's just one of those things. You know, I could uh, read a book about history. It was sinking in my brain. But give me a book about finance or legal trusts or things like that. It'll take me about 50 times to read before it makes any sense. It just, make, it just stimulates you. you it, it you, you does. Find it very it does. And I, 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 why I'm into I really don't know. No, no. Okay. I'm a bit of a nerd, really. That's well, funny. no, that's fine. We've, we've all got our, um, our interests. And so today we're going to talk about the, the gunpowder plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's now the 1st of November. So we're only a few days away from the, uh, the big day. Or should we say the big day that never happened? So... Again, I suppose you're, it's a similar question. How did you become interested in the gunpowder plot? Um, I really sort of got a, a bit of an interest in, in that time when I, I was doing my A-level uh, back in the 70s. And uh, one of the things we were doing was at 16th and 17th century European history. And uh, it was a very strong European emphasis. We, we did an awful lot of Spanish and French side of things. And when you do that, those two centuries, you have to take into account the wars of religion and things of that nature. For some strange reason, I really got quite interested in in the, the, the religious feelings of the times of the 16th and 17th century. Yeah. And you can't help but notice and, and, and follow on, um, you know, the, the whole gunpowder plot stems from religious friction and faction. And, um, you know, I, I, even now I've carried on doing that when I'm, when I'm reading about the Georgians and the Regency time. I'm, I'm following through an awful lot about Catholic emancipation and uh, the, um, the, uh, the strictures and, and, um, and, and 
governances that Catholics were had to undergo for many years, and a lot of that does stem from from the gunpowder plot yeah. in some respects. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's just an overall part of a theme that I I, I enjoy. Well, I I think um like a lot of people, myself included, we we know about the gunpowder plot, or we we think we know a little bit about it. We know about the um the plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament. The gunpowder treason, yes. Gunpowder treason. But we have fireworks yeah. and everything. So um, not everybody knows the whole history of it, I don't think. Um, so this, this particular show, we're going to try and condense the whole thing into about half an hour, just so that everybody's yeah. got a bit of a, an idea about how it happened. So starting off, Bill, what was the background to the gunpowder plot? Essentially, the, the background to it is, is in the roots of religion. Obviously, England became a Protestant country, particularly with the uh, start of Elizabeth's uh, reign. And um, during that time, um, uh, Protestants were the ascendant religion and the Catholics were often seen as being alien and they following the uh, rules of a foreign power, namely the Pope. It didn't help that in 1570, the Pope actually declared that like, it would be legitimate to, to kill the sovereign, i.e. Elizabeth. And there's a whole series of Catholics... Sorry, just, just a minute there. He said it would be legitimate yes, to kill yes, Elizabeth. Yes, yes, yes. So, so this had stemmed from Henry VIII, yeah, that's right, who, yeah. who'd sort of parted company with the, uh, yeah. the Roman Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And his, his daughter, Elizabeth, carried it on. But he, he, he said it would be OK to kill her. Yes, yeah, yes, that's right. So, so mm. basically, you, you've got a, a foreign agency um, saying that, OK, it's OK to kill the monarch, which really wasn't a good idea. And so there, there was a... And also there was a series of, of, of Catholic pro- plots against Elizabeth's life, particularly during the time when Mary, Queen of Scots, was alive. And that carried on right the way through, uh, up until her, her death. And because of that... Um, Catholics were were repressed. I mean, the repression really would would be mainly directed at a, quite often the gentry, quite frankly, because most most common people would just go along with the flow; just they would just carry on. Um, but the repression would mean that, for example, you'd have to attend church at the Anglican church. If you did not attend the Anglican church, uh, then you would be fined. You'd have to be have your children married in the Anglican church, baptised in the Anglican church, and also indeed buried, buried under their rights. And um, a lot of uh, ca- uh, the, the wealthier Catholics would, would, would not attend church, and because of that they would be fined. And they became known as recusants, and therefore they, they, they would be... Um, uh, pay hefty fines for, for not attending church and doing the other things. They found ways around... Um, you know the marriages and things like that, because there'd be a whole the whole um, cadre of, of priests and Jesuits were, which were hidden within England, and uh, a very great um, danger to their own lives. And if they were caught, they would be executed. So, in terms of the numbers of people that were Catholics in England at that time, Bill, what what sort of rough percentage of the population were strictly speaking original Catholics? I would probably think um, declared and open, probably a very small amount, but. Under the surface, I've no doubt there would be a lot of people mm. adhering to the old religion. It must have been a very difficult time. If it you were it Catholic. would have been. I mean, uh, Catholicism was strongest in the north, in Yorkshire and Lancashire, um, and uh, other parts of the South East are much less, much less prevalent. But, but you, it, certainly among the, the gentry, and they could afford to do it. And let's face it, an awful lot of the peasantry and the ordinary people, they just want to get on with their lives as, as they do in, in all so, times. So, in, 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 su- in summary, then, the, the gunpowder plot was all about the um, aggravation that was being caused by the, the state. Uh, with making people go to the Church of England. Yes, yes, and the perpetrators of the plot were gentry, uh, apart from one. And um, it, 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 I would like to think there would be lots of servants and people like that who'd still adhere to the old faith, but probably kept quiet about mm. it. And who, uh, who was the one that you mentioned? Um, one of the plotters was the servant of uh, the uh, instigator of the plot. Right. Um, and he was only included because he found out about the plot and his master, Robert Catesby, sort of persuaded him to join. Yeah. To keep him and know. and um, just so listeners are aware of the time it took place, what what year did the the plot take place? The actual plot took place in sixteen hundred and five. And and how long was it brewing up for? Before uh, best part two years. Right. Okay. Um, when Elizabeth died, um, she uh, was the throne was going to go to James the Sixth of Scotland, and a lot of Catholics then were were, were thinking this could be a change because there was were, there were persecutions before. And, and, and to be fair, there's some justification of the persecution because because there were lots of plots against Elizabeth and her life, and um, and and they generally did involve a lot of Catholics in it, but um, 
James I, a lot of Catholics thought things would change. Prior to becoming king, he made lots of promises um, to various people as a way of means becoming king. And one of the things, he was making promises to the Spaniards and to, to other people that he'd be go, go lax on the Catholic laws, uh, oppression laws. And that's one of the things he did. And the other thing that made the Catholics very optimistic was his wife was Queen uh, Anne, um, Anne of Denmark, uh, the daughter of the King of Denmark. And she was brought up a Lutheran, but she converted to Catholicism. And King James I tolerated that, or King James VI, as he was then in Scotland, tolerated that. And he did, he was the daughter of Mary Queen, sorry, son of Mary Queen of Scots, yeah. who was a, a notable Catholic. So they were quite optimistic that James would um, uh, be accommodating. Also, James wanted to have a treaty with Spain. England had been at war with Spain for over 20 years, and he wanted to have a, war, uh, a peace with Spain. And they thought the Spaniards would 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 influenced James to, to, to be, you know, repeal the laws and be a lot gentler. That didn't turn out, um, partly because even though James got to the throne, um, there were still plots against him in, in quite early days. And, and, and he, he did change his mind a bit. And um, the Spaniards weren't bothered about English Catholics and their freedoms. They just wanted to have peace with England for economic reasons. Mm. And so, and that kicked it off. That's when they thought, oh, we, we need change. But that was probably from a tiny fraction of uh, Catholics. Yeah. Um, one in particular who I consider to be a terrorist and a fanatic who quite early on decided that he wanted to do away with the king. And from a very early start, within months of James coming to the throne, he decided he was going to get rid of him. And who was this? Uh, a guy called Robert Catesby. Right, so he was the leader of the gunpowder plot. He is he? A le- we, we focus on Guy Fawkes. We do, yeah. All the time. Yeah. No, he was not the man. No. Robert Catesby, sometimes known as Robin Catesby. Yeah. So why, why why do we focus so much on Guy Fawkes? Uh, because he was a man who was caught with the, with the fuse and the matches, really. Right, so he was the man who'd had experience with weapons before. Yes, that's it? what he was recruited. He was a right. mercenary. Right. Um, uh, recruited when he's fighting in the Low Countries, which is uh, what is now Holland and Belgium, uh, fighting for the Spanish against the Dutch. Uh, he was a Catholic um, and he was an Englishman from Yorkshire. And he was a soldier by trade and an explosive expert as, uh, to, to boot. Yeah. So t- tell, tell us, tell us about Robert Catesby. Now, Robert Catesby was um, a Catholic uh, gentleman from uh, the Midlands, Warwickshire, born in Lapworth, and um, he uh, was a bit of a wild cannon. Um, he was kept under control whilst his wife was still alive and his father was still alive. But after that, he, he was a bit of a loose cannon. He got involved in the plot. Um, to uh, topple Queen Elizabeth in about 1601 by a chap called Devereux, Earl of Essex. It was a famous plot, and this Earl wanted to depose Elizabeth. It failed, and Catesby is one of the conspirators, along with several other Catholic uh, um, gentry. And um, he was going to be executed, but Queen Elizabeth pardoned him. Oh, right. And with a big fine, obviously. Uh, And what really strikes me about this man's fanaticism was within a few months of being pardoned is that yet again trying to plot against the queen you suddenly think hang about you've had you go you could have been uh, executed in a very nasty way and she's let you off mm. have a bit of grace and, and this was all over religion uh, well basically yeah he, he wanted to 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 get the laws repealed um, and hence he, he came to campaign with that. So when James came along and James didn't re- relax the laws, and James was initially quite relaxed about it, but but with all the you know the, the stirrings up, he, he he got a bit more um, keen on uh, the repression bit, and that's when Catesby decided, right, we're going to deal with this, and that yeah. was quite early on. So Catesby's a bit of a leader, a bit of a ringleader for this this yeah, type of stuff. He was the leader. Yeah. So what other characters were involved in the plot? Uh, obviously, you had uh, a chap called. Uh, um, Guy Fawkes, or Guido Fawkes, as he was known then. Guido Fawkes. Guido Fawkes. Yeah. And he was a soldier recruited later on into the into the conspiracy. And where was he from? Um, he was literally Yorkshire, but uh, when he's recruited, he was in the Low Countries so as a soldier, mercenary yeah. fighting. Um, and he was a, a tough character and, uh, and uh, obviously a, a fanatical um, 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 uh, uh, Catholic. He had others um, like the, the, Win- uh, the Winter Brothers, again Catholic gentry, um, Thomas Percy, a distant relative of the Duke of Earl of uh, Northumberland, um, Francis Tresham, the son of a very notable um, uh, Northamptonshire Catholic recusant, a guy called Thomas Tresham, who's uh, left various monuments to his faith 
in uh, around the Kettering area of Northampton. Uh, and Francis Tresham, he inherited uh, from his father a few months before the plot. You had um, uh, a chap called um, um, Everard Digby, who I'm particularly keen on because he's from a local family from around here, from Rutland, uh, from um, Dry Stone. Yeah. And um, he uh, he was a bit of a gentleman. He was one of the last to be re- recruited. Uh, the, the, the common theme is that the that, that, that provincial gentry. Another common theme about them is they're all re- related as well. Oh, are they? Because you have quite a small group of people. Yeah. You know, within the English gentry, they're a very, very tiny minority. And because of their faith, they probably didn't really want to intera- intermarry with Protestants. So, so they all tend to be interrelated. And, uh, uh, you know, the brother-in-laws or cousins, etc. So where, where did these guys meet then? Uh, initially, they met in London. Uh, Catesby got the, the scheme going together quite early on and he steadily recruited pe- um, recruited client uh, uh, plotters. Yeah. Uh, the initial ones were in London. They had a, a, several metres later on at Daventry um, and in, in the Midlands as well, uh, Cannons, Ashby and Northamptonshire. And, and how long did it take to actually prepare this plot? Well, it, it, it initially was done quite early on. Um, and was, was it always the intention to blow up the Houses of Parliament? Uh, yes, yes. That's, that was Catesby's idea. Yeah. And he, he got it sorted out for about a year before the actual uh, 5th of November 1605. He oh, got did it, he? he? got it put together. Yeah. Um, he hadn't recruited everybody, but, but Parliament was due to, to, to meet. Um, but unfortunately, because the plague arose in London, yeah. they decided to postpone Parliament. So this, this of, was the opening of the Houses of Parliament. The opening of the Houses of Parliament. Oh, right. So a bit like today, really, with, yeah, with COVID. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the plague arrived. A, a hell of a lot more destructive than the current one we have. Yeah, I bet. And, um, <laughs> and they postponed the meeting of Parliament. Right. So instead of it going ahead in the November or then, or then the February, it actually ended up getting towards uh, November the 5th, 2000, uh, 6, 1605. So the, the, the plot was hatched a good, to start a good year before yeah. the actual event itself. And... Um, and he was going to go for Parliament. Uh, in those days, don't imagine Parliament. It's like the big, huge building you have now. Uh, the, the, the meeting where the King was going to be, as it is now, it was in the House of Lords. And the House of Lords was a ramshackle old uh, medieval building, which could quite conceivably be blown up by gunpowder. Yeah. And uh, the idea was that um, they would um, store the gunpowder under the, the, um, under the uh, House of Lords. Initially, they rented premises next to the House of Lords and tried to dig a tunnel underneath it. Uh, that didn't really work out too well. And then, as luck would have it, um, um, uh, the undercrofts were, were up for rent, came up for rent. Uh, and so they got the undercrofts underneath the cellars, i.e. underneath the, um, the, the House of Lords. The, the undercrofts. Undercrofts. That, that's, yeah, we, we call them cellars now, but, but they're actually in those days known as undercrofts. And that's yeah. where merchants would store their woolen or their goods or their things of that nature. So it'd be a good size and that'd be nice and neatly underneath the, the House of Lords and they could get the gunpowder in there and, uh, and, and, and you know, get, get ready for the, the great it- day. 36 barrels, I understand. 36 barrels, yes. That's, that's a lot of, um, Heck of ammunition lot. to get in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Guy Fawkes reckoned it, would be dub- it, w- it was more than twice the amount required. So they were going for the overkill. Now, yeah. what I, you know, I, we, we tend to sort of look at these guys thinking, oh, they're, they're heroes, or oh, they've got romance. And they're terrorists. Yeah. Robert Catesby was a fanatical terrorist, as far as I'm concerned. He was utterly charismatic. People would follow him purely out of his character, and that's what they did. And um, when you think about it, their plan was to blow up the Houses of Parliament at the opening of Parliament. There you would have the king, his wife, Anne, his eldest son and heir, Henry. Um, There'd be the House of Commons, the House of Lords, members of the public, men and women, Catholic and Protestant, the whole lot. So potentially hundreds of people? Hundreds would die. Mm. Hundreds. Now, that to me is an act of terrorism. They couldn't think, oh, we'll take out the king. I'll get, you know, get a must be like the, the killing of the French king, Henry the Fourth. Oh, we'll just sort of get a gun and shoot him. Oh, no, no, we'll blow up all these people. Mm. Which actually, in the end, was their downfall. Yeah. So, obviously, the, the actual plot was foiled. Yeah. How was it foiled? It was kept very, very secret for a while. I mean, Catesby was very canny what he did. He, he, he recruited very carefully. As I say, there are, a lot of them were... Um, were related, so he recruited among his, his cousins and in-laws, etc. And he kept it quite tight. 
um, on the numbers involved. And the graduate had to expand a bit because they needed money. And they, they had to recruit uh, other people like um, uh, Francis Tresham because he got a bit of money. Yeah. Uh, so it gradually expanded a bit. and, um, and they, But they'd done a pretty good job of keeping it quiet. Um, but then about a week before the actual event, uh, the 5th of November, a letter was delivered to the Catholic Lord Monteagle. Yeah. Uh, and that was delivered on the 26th of October. Um, and he was at his tea or whatever, and a letter was delivered to him. And the letter was essentially saying, um, be very careful about attending the opening of Parliament in, in, in not so many words. It didn't say what was going to happen. The, the wording was, was structured some, somewhat differently. And um, uh, that sort of gave a, a, a bit of a, a trigger and a bit of thought. Now, uh, Lord Monteagle was... Um, in fact, I'll read a bit of the letter here, actually. Um, My Lord... Out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have care of your preservation. Therefore, I would advise you as you tender your life to devise some excuse to shift your attendance at this parliament. Well, that, that's very, very clear, Bill. Absolutely. And it yeah. went on a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, Lord, Lord Monteagle, um, although he's a Catholic, and I have to say that these terrorists represented a tiny fraction of the Catholics in England like today's yeah. um, uh, situation. And Lord Monteagle took it to um, the spy master general and the, the, master, the, the master spider, uh, Robert um, Cecil, oh, yeah. who was the son of um, uh, William Cecil, who's William, uh, sorry, Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, great Lord Chancellor. Yeah. And he was also the main man for um, James I. And Robert Cecil had got it twigged. And he took it to the king, who was hunting up at Hatfield at the time. Several days went by. And oddly enough, one of the words in, in the actual letter mentioned blow. And um, and rumour has it that King James twigged onto that because his father, Lord Darnley, had been murdered and he'd been murdered by gunpowder right. in, in, in Edinburgh yeah. um, some years before. And so they, that's what twigged it off. And that's when they authorised a search of um, the underside of, of the, 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 the House of Lords. And they, they initially found uh, Guy Fawkes there with a, by a whole stack of wood. And they quizzed him and he said his name was John Johnson. <laughs> and he was a servant of um, um, Thomas, uh, Thomas Percy, yeah. who, who'd rented the place. Yeah. They, they went away. And then afterwards, uh, Cecil decided, OK, let, let's go. Let's check this out again. And they sent people in again. So, so he just said he was doing something down there. Yeah, for yeah. And they servant. sent them in again. Yeah. And they found Guy Fawkes yet again because he was a man guarding it. Because yeah. what you bear in mind was... They put the gunpowder in, then prior to the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes has left it. To, to, his job was to set the thing off yeah. and guard it and set it off. All the other conspirators went up. They, to, they'd gone. They'd gone up to the Midlands because their job... Get out of it. Their job was to raise the country after the king had gone. Oh, right. So Guy Fawkes was the man in charge. The other ones, Kate's been at, they, they were going to get arms and raise a bit of a rebellion. Yeah. So Everard Digby, our local man from here, his job was, uh, he was based at... Um, just outside Coventry, and his job was to go to Coombe Abbey near Coventry to kidnap Princess Elizabeth. So the idea of the king would be blown up, and Princess Elizabeth was his daughter. Um, and um, because his son and heir was going to be blown up down at Parliament. Yeah. And Princess Elizabeth thought they could kidnap her. She was nine years of age, and she would become the future monarch. They'd make turn her into a Catholic, and she'd be nice and amenable and amendable to... to um, uh, be, become the monarch. Uh, though, if you look at her later life, they they picked the wrong woman. Okay, so so the plan was to blow, yeah. blow Parliament up, kill all yep. the people that were involved in power at that time. That's right. Go to the Midlands. Yeah. Get Elizabeth. Yeah. Get Elizabeth. Get, make her yeah. a queen. Yeah, make her a Protestant queen. queen. A Catholic. Uh, uh, sorry, a Catholic, yeah, yeah. Catholic and queen. Turn her into Catholic yeah. and then have the rebellion. Yeah. Guy's fork job was to to be there. He was the only man there. To, yeah. to set things off. But he was found the second time around. They obviously dug around, found the wood, yeah. had a bit of a fight, and he was captured. So, so oh, they, they did, yeah. So they did have a bit of a fight down there. Yeah, I think he put up a struggle. They, they probably thought, what, this guy seems to spend an awful lot of time as a yeah, servant look, down now, in why, the cellar. Why, why would we sat there guarding a, a yeah. pile of wood? Yeah. Um, obviously, it wasn't. It was covering the, um, the gunpowder. Yeah. So he was taken, taken to the tower. And uh, the others had, uh, really fled properly up to the, up to the Midlands. Uh, and, and they, they, they carried on up there. Guy Fawkes was taken to the tower and King James authorised the use of torture. Nowadays, we think, oh, it's common torture in, in the Tudor times, Stuart, uh, it happened all the time. No, 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 it wasn't. 
had to be authorised by Parliament of the King. So King James had to authorise the torture of, of, King, uh, of, of Guy. Uh, and in the letters to it, he, also, he first authorised mild torture, and then, then you could also go on to the major torture. So mild torture, for example? Mild torture was the manacles. Right. So you'd have the manacles put on you, and then you're hauled up by your arms, which is obviously extremely painful. Well, that was a mild torture. Um, the other form of torture was the major torture, which is rarely used, and that was the rack. And Descri- Describe what the rack is, Bill. The rack basically... Um, uh, the English one used in this circumstance is not one that was horizontal, it was vertical. So the pr- prisoner would be stood, his hands tied above his head, and obviously uh, also his feet tied to the other end of the rack, mm. and it's ratcheted up, oh. stretching an individual. Ouch. Um, quite, it was rarely authorised, but King James did authorise the use of the rack for um, Guy Fawkes. Normally when people shown at the rack... Often they've just shown it and they they kind of think I yeah. t- say everything that usually worked. Yeah. But I think it's also good to say that England was not like continental Europe. Torture was not usual, and I think we ought to bear that in mind mm. in some respects. So um, the rack would have been pretty horrendous. It would stretch you, dislocate dislocate your bones and your, your joints, and you've been pretty sorry state afterwards. Um, Guy Fawkes held out for a couple of days and then he then he betrayed. He didn't betray. He, he just you know, people will talk under those circumstances. He was a tough guy. Mm. Uh, and he he um, obviously said who, who the conspirators were. Well, I must admit, to, have to, you know, to be under that sort of pain with your sockets being pulled out. Yeah. Uh, it was a long time. Quite a brave guy. Yeah, he was a brave guy. He's a tough guy. He's a mercenary, you yeah. know. And, um, he, 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 so he, he then let out the names of the, the other conspirators? Yeah, he, 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 he gave out the names of the conspirators. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I, I reckon by then they got a pretty good idea. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Cecil, uh, Robert Cecil got his finger on the pulse. Got mm. a good idea. The, the conspirators, meanwhile, had fled up to the Midlands. Um, Catesby ended up in Staffordshire. Um, so, so did word get out that um, the plot had been foiled? Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it'd been, well, they knew, they knew, they yeah. could tell. They got... Well, the fact, the fact that it didn't go up, it didn't get blown up. Yeah, well. yeah, they, 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 because they, they had people down there, one oh, or right. two of them, some of them were still down there. They, yeah. they knew about it had gone. They fed up, ended up in a, uh, after raiding Warwick Castle for some arms and some horses, oh. they ended up in Holbeach, Holbeach House in Staffordshire. Um, and that's where um, um, uh, some of them split up. I mean, this, the thing about Robert Catesby was, he, he'd fed from London when he knew that the, 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 the plot had gone wrong. And yet when he's at Holbeach House, he did say to the likes of um, Everard Digby, oh, the king is dead. And because um, Digby was all, already up, up, up that way. And uh, the king is dead. And so it's and, and so part, you know, so uh, we're, we're OK. We're OK to carry on. Well, he lied. He, even though he just lied, basically. Yeah. And yeah. Everard Digby uh, sort of believed him. So Everard Digby went off somewhere else. These other guys held up at Whole Beach House. They're surrounded by a posse. Uh, the, the word posse, yeah. Old, um, people, a bit of a fight, a uh, bit of a problem because they, they, because their powder was wet and the powder was dry, they left it to, uh, wet rather, they left the powder to dry in front of the fire. And a spark came out, <laughs> hit the powder, whoosh, bit of a fire, burnt a lot of them quite badly. So, so the, mess, the, the lesson they, is they, don't, they don't leave wet gunpowder yeah. by the fire. <laughs> and there's a bit of a fight. Catesby and uh, a few others were killed, um, including um, Thomas Percy. Yeah. And um, uh, the rest were catch, captured, even though they, they were wounded. Um, uh, Francis Tresham was captured uh, uh, as well. Yeah. And they were captured and taken down to the tower. And um, and Edward Everard Digby was also he actually was surrendered to the authorities. Uh, he's found himself as a bit of a gentleman, and he surrendered to the authorities. And uh, their whole lot were taken down to the tower, apart from the servant, uh, who was um, taken to um, uh, a different prison because obviously he wasn't uh, one of the gentry. The servant was a guy called Thomas Bates, and he was a servant to uh, Catesby. And what happened to these guys when they after they were taken to the um, tower? There was a bit of rough treatment, um, and uh, they were prepared for trial. Basically, uh, the the trials went ahead. Uh, Everard Digby was the first to go on trial, and he pleaded guilty. The only one to actually plead guilty, he pleaded guilty. Therefore, he was allowed a speech at his trial, and he, he said his piece. Um, if he thought it might have been mitigating for him, no, it wasn't. He was still sentenced to a traitor's death. The others likewise went through a trial. 
they were going to be found guilty. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Sir Edward Coke, who was the um, the prosecutor, he was going to find him guilty, and they were guilty. <laughs> That's mm. uh, and. Um, so um, and they they're all found guilty and sentenced to sentenced to a traitor's death. Well, they all well they all tried at the same time. Uh, no, d- d- different batches. Um, Digby was the first to be tried. The others were tried a bit later. What about Guy Fawkes? Guy Fawkes was tried with the the, the, the second batch. Mm. Um, the first to go for execution was Everard Digby, and the others followed on um, a day or so later. And what what type? What what you mentioned a traitor's death? A, a traitor's death. We commonly call it hung, drawn, and quartered. Now that's incorrect. You're actually drawn, hung. Drawn, drawn is. Now, drawn, what normally would happen is you'd be drawn. Um, with, um, you wouldn't have an artist sketching you then? Uh, no, you would. Well, you probably might have done. You but, might have. Um, yeah, you're drawn with your feet tied to the back of a horse and you're literally dragged through the streets. Now, for the purposes of these people, they weren't, uh, ex- uh, weren't drawn that way because by the time they would have got the executioner, they would have been in no fit condition to... Uh, endure, endure the punishment and also it would deny the crowd a nice show because they've been such a mess so what they did was they, they constructed wat- wattle hurdles or sleighs and they were laid and strapped to these sleds wattle sleds um, uh, with the, the, the back back to the ground and their the, the face uh, facing the sky and their head being so low they would not draw the air of ordinary people and therefore they were dragged in that state to uh, the place of execution was St Paul's uh, churchyard, which some people thought was a bit not right to do it there, but they did it. St Paul's churchyard by the old old cathedral, and in the case of Everard Digby, he was taken to the um, onto the scaffold, uh, and he made a nice speech, but he didn't repent about his sins, and the executioner hung him, but hung him very very sh- a very short time because he's not really repented, so he's fully conscious before the executioner set to work. Do you want to know the details of what they do? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm sure listeners would like to, but I just wonder whether we ought to put a little health warning on it, Bill. Yeah, but if I were you, yes. Oh, okay. So if you, um, want to, if you want to turn off now, it, do yeah. so. It, essentially, uh, the individual would be hung. In the case of Sir Everard Digby, it was very short. In other ones, they repented fully and they had a longer hanging. Um, and uh, they would be, once uh, they were taken off alive, from from the noose, dropped down, then put onto um, uh, the uh, a board. They would, the men would then be castrated, and then they would be disembow- disemboweled alive. And the car- heart would be removed. And um, in the case of Re- Everard Digby, the rumor goes his heart was removed. And as the executioner held it up um, for to the crowd, saying, "This is the heart of a traitor," Sir Everard Digby said, "No, it is not." Now, I somehow suspect that's not quite no, true. Probably a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> yeah. And then afterwards, the body is quartered. Basically, the limbs are chopped off mm. and um, uh, uh, paraded. The head is off, taken off as well. And that's often put down at you know, you know, Tower Bridge or somewhere like that. And that happened to the others. Now, Guy Fawkes was quite clever about it. Was he? Yeah, he was in a dreadful state when he was taken to be executed. He was executed about a day later. And he they mounted up a ladder to go up to, to the... Um, uh, up to the uh, to get the noose and though he's in a bad condition his legs could barely work he actually went up really high up the ladder and when they put a noose on, on him he could ju- he could jump off and that would break his neck so he's actually dead oh so he killed himself yep yeah, yeah. He, he cleverly went high yeah, up the ladder yeah. and yeah. Jumped, jumped down and avoided all that and other avoid stuff and all that oh, uh, unfortunate crikey. thing and you've got to be it's really ghastly because the family will be watching this yeah. uh, Everard's wife was watching um, uh, and um uh, you know, the, it, it was a shame. Um, Robin, Robert Catesby didn't have to suffer that. He was killed at um, Whole Beach House. Yeah. Uh, so he, he he didn't have to suffer. Another one, the um, uh, conservatives, um, uh, Francis Tresham, he died of natural causes in the the, um, uh, uh, the Tower of London. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was a death. And then, and, and, and that was that. And, and not long afterwards, Parliament instituted... Um, uh, a, a, a day of celebration for the 5th of November. And that's where we've carried on. We carry on. In now. quotes, celebrating Absolutely. it. Absolutely. A little quirk of history is at the time of the Commonwealth, i.e. the, the time of um, uh, the, the um, end of Charles I and the advent of Cromwell's rule, which we call the Commonwealth, public celebrations were banned throughout England. But the only public celebration that was permitted was the 5th of November. Yeah. Which, oddly enough, was celebrating the preservation of a king. 
and yet Cromwell and his people had actually executed a king. <laughs> And it, it, it and it's carried on to to this day. Yeah. I mean, nowadays it's 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 like a bonfire now, but you don't really see many guys being burned now. But certainly, we know I were children. It's very very common. So, is, wasn't is, it? is the way we celebrate it now? Is it just a British thing, or, or is it celebrated in other countries? Uh, it's basically British. Yeah. Um, it did go to the um, American colonies. Yeah. Uh, so during the time of the Pilgrim Fathers and people like that, uh, they did celebrate it as being bon uh, as you know Guy Fawkes Day, and that carried on for a while. Then it gradually drifted away from being a celebration of the gunpowder plot to an anti-popery uh, uh, celebration. So you'd be, you know, the effigies were of the Pope. Uh, and, that, and it carried on into the 18th century very, very much. That. And then it, the, is, the effigies changed. So you, you get the effigy of King George III would be burnt instead when you get towards the revolution or Lord, oh, right. Lord Bute or Lord Yeah, but now, now we've gone back to the original. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that kind of, it, it's, it's really got, essentially now it's, it's a British thing. Yeah. Now, whether they, I, I don't know whether they do it in Canada or Australia. I probably doubt it, but I don't know. That was essentially British. Hmm. So looking back, let's say the plot had been successful and the establishment had been blown up, royalty, and what do you think the legacy would have been? What do you think would have happened? I, I, I just utterly fail to see how they could ever succeed. Um, the, the level of disgust to the nation would have been massive. But also among Roman Catholics, who the vast bulk were loyal to the crown and, 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 and the country. And, uh, and I, I think the revulsion would have been quite, quite, quite intense. And let's face it, I don't think they gave much thought to what would happen if they were successful. Yeah, about 50 blokes or whatever assembling in the Midlands outside Birmingham. Now, what are they going to do? Uh, come on now. Um, you know, have they got any generals there? Have they got a... No, have they got an aristocrat? They thought they'd get, uh, recruit the Earl of Northumberland uh, to be their, their, their leader. He didn't know anything about it, the Earl of Northumberland, but they thought, oh, well, we'll have a word with him. They sort of think, so they, they blow up Parliament, they'll go along to see an English magnate like the Earl of Northumberland and say, oh, can you lead us now? Very naive. I mean, you think of, the, you know, they've got no generals, no aristocrats, no people with, with, with retainers or anything like that. Um uh, it, it, it beggars belief. So your view is that it would have just fizzled out. They'd have been captured and yes, killed anyway. I, th- I think people would have turned against them because mm. certainly when they when it ha- when it had failed and they were trying to raise people, nobody would come to their cause. Yeah. So I I I, I just think it would have just people uh, the sheer revulsion. People would 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 have reacted Catholic and Protestant um, because the damage that they did to Roman English English Roman Catholics was immense. Absolutely immense. King James, I've no doubt, would have calmed down. He'd got his treaty with Spain. Um, he would have calmed down over the, the persecution. Yes, there was a big problem with the rising Puritanism in England. They were a big problem. They, they were very anti catholic and stirring things up. But when you had, you know, a plot which was about to blow up the establishment, you know, the laws were enforced and... Uh, it kept things in place through up until 1829 when the Catholic emancipation... So what, what, was, the, what, was, the general, what was the general What was the general feeling in the country after the plot had been discovered, they'd been executed by the, by the, the general population? What was the general feeling? Oh, revulsion. And yeah, 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 mm. it wasn't, it was not popular. So they were considered terrorists? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you, if somebody did that to Parliament now... Of course. What, what would you call them? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Industry, in, and yet, you know, you know, without knowing a lot about it, for some people wouldn't know all that detail... We seem to see Guy Fawkes as almost like a sort of Robin Hood type yeah. character. A bit like the V Vendetta, from Vendetta film, isn't it? Yeah, the Guy Fawkes yeah. masks and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, and yeah, there is that sort of nobility about it. You know, the underdog going for the establishment. Yeah, the only man to enter Parliament with the right intention, shall we say. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, well, yeah well, it is yeah. what it is. With 300, yeah. 400 years passing, then uh, we can afford that 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 luxury. Well, I... I Bill, thanks ever so much. That's a really good insight yeah. to the, the history of the gunpowder plot, which I think a lot of people probably, probably don't know about. Oh, no, it's, it's interesting times, but yeah. to me, the big baddie is Robert Catesby. He's my baddie. Guy he, Fawkes, he's your baddie, is he? I don't mind Guy Fawkes. No. He, 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 he was, was just, just a mercenary. He was just a, a tool yeah. in, the, in the hands of uh, the Bin Laden of the uh, seven, six, 17th century. Yeah. So thanks, thanks again for um, sharing that with us.
So just before we go, Bill, what, what current up and coming projects do you have that you'd like to tell listeners about? Uh, well, we, we, we were going to do a lot more in, in terms of themed walks for the Stanford Guides tours. But unfortunately, from the announcements that occurred recently and all the lockdowns, we've had to put all of that on hold, unfortunately. Yeah. But but we will be pushing forward with that. I'm currently writing um, more tours with regard to Stanford. I'm doing a lot of research into the Regency time of um, uh, the Reg- Prince Regent George IV about, and I'm trying to do a bit of writing around that particular topic, uh, uh, which, um, uh, you know, hopefully in, in maybe about a year's time might come to fruition. Yeah, uh, It's a project I've been nursing for quite some time. Having worked in a stately home, you get a bit of a feel for these families and how they got on. So when you, when you say a project and writing, are you talking about writing a book? Yes. Ah, yes, yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, and um, I've visited lots of stately homes, read in the backgrounds of many British aristocratic families and there's a wealth of things to say about them i'm not yeah. interested in the peasantry stuff like that i'm not you know i'm, I don't, I'm not interested in the, the the weird antics they got up to and their way of life which i find absolutely fascinating that's, fasc- that's brilliant that's and- very sort of wrong saying i'm not interested yeah in the so, so where can they'll people- come in and sort of a side role where can people find out more about your stuff Oh, no, a while yet. <laughs> You're on Instagram and any any social media? Yes, yeah, Instagram, William David Cunningham, I'm on that. Yeah. Um, and um, my Facebook, my Facebook's more personal thing, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll put that on. So uh, again, thanks ever so much for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. My thanks go to today's guest, Bill Cunningham, historian and tour guide from the Stamford Mayor's Guides. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I would be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.